topic of the lecture today is brucellosis. Now, what is brucellosis? Brucellosis actually gives a term that depicts the meaning of infection caused by brucella. So, brucellosis is actually infection, a bacterial infection caused by an organism called, called brucella. Brucella is gram-negative cocci, basically. If we have to look at it, it's gram-negative cocci, which is positive to both catalase and other uh, culture modifications that we use these days. So what it does that it gets into your system and cause different kind of pathological manifestations. Now, brucellosis basically happens in cattle, sheep, and this kind of organism. And zoonotic, it's actually a zoonotic infection. Zoonotic infection means that it can affect both species. It can affect animals as well as it can affect humans too. So basically, the basic host of uh, brucellosis or brucella is animals, cattle, sheep. But it can get to your uh, system by different kind of methods. Now, what methods are they through which a brucella organism will get to your body and cause brucellosis? Now, this is a patient which is suffering from brucellosis. This is just made a depiction of what a brucellosis patient will look like. Because he will be immunocompromised deficiently. So what happens in brucellosis is that it can get to your system by basically four ways. And that's what, what's called that mode of transmission. How does this organism get entry into your system? Now, the first possibility is that you ate red meat. You ate meat which contained this organism, which contained this pathogen. This pathogen was present inside a cattle. You went for it, you slaughtered that cattle or whatever the way you got that meat from. And then you went on and uh, prepared that for your meal. And it wasn't properly cooked and it, this organism is going to get entry inside your system and cause brucellosis. That was first mode of transmission. What's the second mode of transmission? Second mode of transmission is if that organism which was suffering like cattle, like buffalo or something like that. So if that organism was present inside that cattle or that, organism, uh, or that uh, buffalo or something like that, so what's going to happen? It's going to get into the blood, into the uh, milk of that animal. And you drink that milk, you take that milk without properly heating it. It contains that pathogen, it will get to your system and cause brucellosis. So either you're going to get it from the meat or from what? Or from, your, uh, from the milk of that uh, animal. So there, these are two methods. What's the third method? Third method is that it can get through your breaks in the skin. Like if my if I have a little, little break in my skin and I get in contact with such animal which is suffering from this pathology, this organism has the capability to break through your uh, uh, defenses, break through that uh, shredded part of skin and get to your system and cause brucellosis. Right? And the fourth part is that the fourth uh, way it can get to your system is if you get in contact with the secretions. Now those secretions can be anything, right? Those secretions can be anything. If you get in contact with the secretions of that organism, of that animal or of that person which has this pathology, you're going to get it. So these are the four basic uh, factors which are responsible for getting this organism into your system, for getting this organism inside your body. Now, once it's inside your body, what's going to happen? What's going to be uh, the pathogenesis? How is it going to get inside the system? How is it going to propagate there? And how is it going to cause brucellosis there? Right? Now, let's talk about the etiology of brucella. Etiology of brucella, we talked about it that brucella comes from different organisms. Brucella has, is a different genus, right? It contains different organisms different strains cause different kind of pathology this is what it looks like and it it has different strains it can cause different kind of pathologies based on the uh, pathological strain that is affecting your body so if the strain is uh, kind of mild 
pathological in nature it's not going to cause severe pathological consequences it's going to cause mild pathological consequences so the effect the pathogenesis or you can say the after effects of this disease depend upon the strain of that pathological organism which got inside your body so once it gets inside your body what's the incubation period for this what's the incubation period incubation period varies from two weeks to six weeks and in some cases months it can get up to months and we can differentiate between brucellosis by acute brucellosis and chronic brucellosis what's the mindset of acute brucellosis that if infection got in there and sustained there for uh, six to eight weeks it's acute infection because incubation period was between two to six weeks so if it goes up to two months it's fine it's acute but if it stays there it's going to be chronic in nature so once it get inside the system what's going to happen either it's going to be acute brucella infection or it's going to be chronic brucella infection what's going to happen in acute brucella infection in acute brucella infection let me tell you the basic pathogenesis of it so that you might get the idea and then you get these slides so what happens is that brucella organism gets inside your body through all of those four methods we talked about any of those methods is viable any of those met methods can cause brucellosis once it gets inside your system where does it go it immediately goes to your lymphatic systems it immediately goes to your lymph nodes and there it degenerates there it propagates there it reaches its uh, maximum limit with which it can affect the body so the first target organ it has is your lymph nodes what's the second afterwards what it does it goes to you either it goes to your reticular and uh, reticular system reticular endothelial system or it goes to your genital system what's going to be in reticular endothelial system it's going to be spleen it's going to be liver it either goes to spleen it either goes to liver so these are the organs which where which it goes to or it can goes to genitalia and in genitalia if it's male it's going to be prostate and testes and if it's female it's going to be either uterus or it can either be if the woman is pregnant it's going to be what placenta so it's going to affect your genitals so two systems reticular and genital system so these two systems are actually uh, you can say the house of brucella inside your body they get there they store themselves there they gather themselves there and cause different kind of pathologies in those systems like for example if it's going to affect your placenta it's going to cause different kind of pathologies which will lead to retainment of placenta right so wherever it goes it causes different kind of pathologies so once it got inside your body and got to your systems or it's inside your blood if it's inside your blood what is it going to be called bacteremia if a bacteria is present inside your bloodstream it's going to be what bacteremia so through the blood it can go to any organ it can go to any organ but we talked about which organs basically get affected because of this pathology so this organism has got entry inside your systems once it got uh, entry inside your systems what kind of immune response do you expect do you expect innate response or do you do you expect humoral response both responses are activated not one both of the immune responses are activated both immune systems respond to this kind of pathogen when both systems respond to this kind of pathogen what's going to happen first what's going to happen different kind of pathogens will be found they will be detected and for what you will do what your in your immunity will be activated and it will try to kill all those bacteria through what they will kill them through these antitoxins they will kill them through these antibacterials and through the other immunity system they will activate what macrophages now those macrophages will come in they will come into the play and when those macrophages come into the play they are going to try to engulf these pathogens now there's a red sign here right there's a red big red sign here present that 
ओके दिस इज अवर इम्यूनिटी वी आर गोइंग टू इंगल्फ दीज ऑर्गेनिज्म इन ऑर्डर टू किल दीज ऑर्गेनिज्म बट ब्रुसेला इज वन ऑफ दोज ऑर्गेनिज्म विच आर गोइंग टू गेट इन साइड ऑफ इन साइड योर मेकअप एज एंड नॉट लेट इट किल यू एंड दे विल एक्चुअली प्रोपोगेट दे दे विल स्टॉप एवरी सिस्टम दैट लीड्स टू देयर डेथ एंड दे विल प्रोपोगेट दे एंड विल लीड टू ऑक्सीडेटिव स्ट्रेस एंड बर्स दैट and come in contact with the other one so our body must be thinking that okay i have this organism i have to eat it i have to kill it right these phagosomes these macrophages they're going to get there they're going to try to kill it by engulfing them but engulfing them is a big mistake because when they engulf them right when they engulf them what's going to happen mostly major chances are that it's going to stay there and stop all the systems that are going to get to their death and reversely it will actually use that environment and propagate there and when the time is right it will burst through that so it is kind of a very difficult pathology to understand but when all of this is happening what's secreting what's being secreted interferon gamma is being secreted and what interferon gamma does interferon gamma actually promotes this activity interferon gamma actually promotes this uh, macrophagic activity phagocytic activity to engulf these organisms and kill these organisms and different kind of interleukins come into the play we are going to talk about them so when acute brucella infection is happening interferon gamma is going to be there and it's going to activate what there are two kind of macrophages these are classical macrophages classical activated macrophages and what is this this is alternate pathway in activated macrophages so interferon gamma is going to activate more of these alternate path pathway activated macrophages and they are going to retaliate they are going to try to uh, affect this uh, organism and what kind of interleukins are produced now interleukins there are basically uh, five interleukins that are very important whenever you go for the pathogenesis of this kind of organism like brucella interleukin 2 interleukin 4 sorry interleukin 2 interleukin 6 interleukin 8 10 12 right and among them interleukin 2 promotes this activity while interleukin 6 10 12 they don't promote this activity they actually deescalate them you have to keep that in mind interleukin 2 is the one that's promoting this activity and interleukin 6 10 12 they are just deescalating this activity they are not promoting this activity so what happens what happens is that uh, interleukin 6 interleukin 12 and tumor necrosing factor alpha are going to be in what excessive amount in a try to you know uh, fight this infection on the other hand in the uh, in the cell intracellularly what happens this is that gamma particle that was present and glucose is going to go down because of what because of this infection now this is what happens in acute infection right so what will happen if it's a chronic brucella infection so in this no interferon gamma because interferon gamma is not being produced it's a chronic infection it's called undulating fever right it's called undulating fever what does undulating fever means it means it, it will go up it will go down it will have spikes it won't have spikes it's proco it will happen that it won't happen that it will happen that it won't happen so it's actually a chronic infection right it's called undulating fever so interferon gamma will be produced in response to acute brucella infection but not in response to chronic brucella infection so what kind of macrophages do you expect there what kind of macrophage will be there what kind of uh, uh, macrophagic activity will be found we talked about here alternate pathway macrophages are here but no classical right but in this instant we'll have more of these classically activated macrophages because now the body has had enough time to respond to this kind of pathogen to respond to this kind of uh, uh, pathological activity inside your body so what's the what's the body response is going to be they are going to activate more and more of these classically activated macrophages and try to engulf these organisms and cause them to die and cause them to eliminate it, uh, cause them eliminated inside the body but what happens it's not happening because of what because they actually propagate inside the macrophages so what kind of interleukin uh, activity will be here now in this instance gamma activity will be up glucose will be up 
interleukin 12 interleukin 6 tumor necrosing factors all of these factors which were responsible to acute brucella infection won't be produced they won't be here so that's why it's going to be chronic it's not having all of these acute factors but on the other hand it's being affected majorly by these chronic factors which regulate them and in chronic brucella infection once it gets inside your organs like if it got inside your genitals if it got inside your reticular endothelial system or any other system it's going to stay there because there's no proper way to eliminate it afterwards these macrophages which are supposed to kill them are going to be the next home for them so it's quite difficult to eliminate this infection now let's talk about how does this immunity and pathogenesis come into the play right so this is a phagosome which contains a brucella organism this is a phagosome which engulfed a brucella organism because it thought that when it will engulf that brucella organism it will definitely kill the brucella organism but what happens we talked about is phagosomes these macrophages they are unable to perform this activity because of different kind of chemical mediators this uh, this brucella will secrete and this in turn will compromise their function of killing this organism and actually they will inhabit this place they'll propagate in this place they'll regenerate in this place and when the time is right they'll burst through this bubble right so this is a cytoplasm this is a brucella which entered to tl4 and when it entered your system when it entered your system what's going to happen this phagosome took it inside right this phagosome took it, took it inside this brucella organism was engulfed by this phagosome and what happened what happened was that there's no stress there's no endo reticular stress present right and when all of these are present messenger rna decay will happen now there's no messenger rna uh, no messenger rna present so messenger rna decay will happen when messenger rna decay is happening it means there, that no new proteins will be produced none of the new proteins will be coming into the play so due to which what will happen messenger rna splicing will happen messenger rna splicing will happen as you can see this is a messenger rna and now it's being spliced messenger rna splicing will happen through this chemical mediator now when messenger rna splicing is happening what's going to happen the next it's going to affect the nfxb now one is what is nfxb nfxb is actually uh, a molecule attached to this uh, and it's going to go where it's going to go to the nucleus when it goes to the nucleus it's going to cause these changes it's going to secrete tumor necrosing factor alpha it's going to secrete interleukins 1b it's going to secrete interleukin 6 now when these are secreted what kind of effect they have now when this nfx we got in there it released this potassium it released this ikpp what is called now this brucella infection is going to do what it's going to secrete different kind of mediators which will lead to their messenger RNA decay which led to these secretions now messenger RNA is being decayed it's not being produced no proteins are being produced so what's going to happen it's going to cause MYGADD it's an it's what you can say a chemical name for something uh, a chemical name for the intermediates which are going to affect this phagosome once it affects your phagosome it also has the same results of this uh, reaction that we had earlier and with nfxp got inside your nucleus and ikk and pp was converted right so now poly ubiquinated mal tlr is present here because of all of this infection and what happened this phagosome is of no use messenger rna decay happened and due to all of this what happened we got into secretions of tumor nucleosome factors interleukins 2 interleukins beta 1 and interleukins 6. Next, let's talk about the clinical features of this patient. So a patient got brucella infection. We talked about what are the four basic uh, organs which are going to get affected in response to this infection. We talked about it's going to get inside your liver. We talked about it's going to get inside your uh, uh, spleen. We talked about it's going to get inside your genitals. In the middle, it's, it's going to be prost uh, prostate and testes. On the other hand, it's female is going to be uh, your uh, ureter and uh, if the female is pregnant, it's going to be a placenta. So all of these organisms when get affected, they will have their clinical features, their related clinical features. 
So when you look for the clinical features in the patient which is suffering from brucella infection, you have to look that either any of these systems are being affected, like if the patient presents to you with orchitis, it means that this organism is residing in his testes. It means the testes are being affected. That's why the patient is having this orchitis, right? So we have to look for these clinical features as well so that you might get to know that which organs are being the basic target for this pathogen. So first of all, they're going to be febrile illness because it's a bacterial infection. It's a gram negative cocci, which causes a bacterial infection. It will, it will cause febrile illness that will lead to fever and afterward it will lead to acute monoarthritis. What is acute monoarthritis? Mono means one, arthritis means inflammation of the joint. So it will lead to inflammation of one joint and it will be acute. It won't be chronic, it won't stay there for long. So these are the three basic clinical features of this pathology. It's going to go from febrile illness to fever to acute monoarthritis. And if it's happening in undulating fever that we have known that we talked about, we talked about it's an undulating fever, it's not going to stay the same. So it it's all of these are going to happen in undulating pattern. And there comes the muscul musculoskeletal sy symptoms because of acute monoarthritis is happening and musculoskeletal sy uh, symptoms will be coming in. So what do you expect in a patient? You're going to expect febrile illness in that patient. You're going to expect fever in that patient and you're going to expect acute monoarthritis in, this patient, in that patient. In what pattern? In undulating pattern. It's going to be in breaks. It's going to be in undulating patterns. And with this undulating pattern, the symptoms of musculoskeletal system will come into the play, right? So what are the clinical features? The pet clinical features that you will look at. Now this was a background. This was the monologue of this uh, pathology. This was something that you look for. Now, what symptoms a patient will present to you with? First of all, it's going to be fever and sweats. We talked about it. It's, an, it's a bacterial infection. It's going to cause uh, febrile illness. It's going to cause fever. And what's going to happen? It's going to be fever with sweats, right? Next, apathy and fatigue. Patient will be fatigued. Patient will be apathic. Next on, we'll have loss of appetite. It's not like brucella is going to cause loss of appetite. Any kind of infection which raises your blood temperature, which causes these pathologies will lead to eventually loss of appetite because now the systems in the brain which are responsible for hunger are being, are being denervated, are, being, uh, are not being stimulated that much. Next on, you're going to have weight loss because it's a chronic bacterial infection or acute bacterial infection or whatever it is it's affecting your body, it's affecting your system, it's causing uh, destruction of different cells and uh, due to this fever and due to all of these factors which are being released and these chemicals being released and the major uh, factor being this loss of appetite, you will lead to weight loss. Next on you have non-specific myalgias, you'll be sitting, you'll be fresh and then you'll have these non-specific myalgias due to what? Due to these undulating patterns of this fever, these uh, febrile illnesses and these uh, monoarthritis. Next one, you will have headache in the patient. You will see the chills. We talked about it's going to be fever, it's going to be sweating, and with it, it's going to be chills. You'll see this phenomena happening. Next one, you'll have depression in, this, in that patient. Depression, why? Patient is having fever, patient is having apathy, patient is having loss of appetite, weight loss, non specific myalgias, headache, chills. Why not depression? Patient is going to be depressed. Patient is not eating. Patient is apathic. Patient is fatigued. Next one, patient is going to have lethargy. Patient is going to have lymphocytic meningoencephalitis in that patient. It's going to cause endocarditis. And end of it, it's going to have metastatic abscesses or inflammations inside the breast. Or it can be anywhere inside the body. So these are the symptoms, these are the clinical features that the patient will present to you with or what you'll look inside for the uh, look inside in the patient, right? So what's it going to cause? It When it gets inside a cell, when it gets inside a system, it can cause granulomas. So it's also associated with the granuloma formation. So granulomas are actually a byproduct of this pathology. Granulomas are being formed. Now, 
this endocarditis because it's a bacterial infection it can get to your heart it can prone your heart for secondary infection and this may lead to endocarditis it can lead to lymphocytic meningoencephalitis too so all of these uh, symptoms and these pathologies are results or the clinical features that brucella will come through that brucella will present with next on what are the diagnostic clues what do we look for when we are going to diagnose a patient what are the clues that will give us a hint about brucella patient is presenting to you with fever with chills and rigors you might be thinking it's dengue you might be thinking it's malaria you might be thinking it's typhoid how do you differentiate how do you differentiate it how do you differentiate it from these pathologies and how do you get to this pet diagnosis of brucella what are going to be those diagnostic clues so we talked about that animal exposure is the basic risk factor or the basic mode of transmission in this pathology so first of all you will talk about the contact with animals that have you ever been in contact with animal in the recent past in the recent 8 to 10 weeks we talked about the incubation period right we talked about it's going to be 2 to 6 weeks so it's going to happen within 2 to 6 weeks so you have to ask for the uh, history of last 4 to 5 months or be more specifically for last 2 months where have you been were you in contact with any animals were those animals uh, uh, affected by brucella and how do they know that their organism or their cattle are going to be are affected by brucella you have any idea what it does is that it causes uh, abortion in the cattle right it causes abortion in the cattle brucella causes abortion in the cattle so that that person will know that uh, yes there was an abortion or whatever it was and with my cattle there was this problem so you have to ask that have you ever been in contact in the last two months with any kind of cattle if he tells you yes if he tells you yes i own many sheep and uh, they're present inside my home you have to think about brucella immediately if he tells you that yes i go and milk my cow you have to think about brucella immediately so contact with animals is the first key to your diagnosis next on have you ever been traveling to those endemic areas have you traveled to those endemic areas what are those endemic areas maybe some people are suffering from this brucella infection so have you traveled to those areas which areas are going to be what areas are that maybe it's those areas which are rural in nature and uh, people they are getting affected because of brucella and you go there as a doctor you go there as a physician to treat that infection you might get that or it can be a cattle form it can be a sheep form right so you have to ask about the traveling history of that patient next one you have to talk about the employment in a diagnostic microbiology laboratory what next person can get affected those people which do your blood testing every day maybe they get in contact with this uh, organism how we talked about that one mode of transmission was that it can get inside a body through the breaks inside a skin if there's any break in your skin if there's any pathology in your skin it's going to get in there right so it's going to get there very easily if there's a break in your skin if there's uh, any kind of pathology in your skin that might you know expose uh, your body to this organism so these microbiologists who are working with blood continuously not knowing that this person is suffering from uh, brucella before doing the test they might get in contact with it and they might get this pathology consumption of unpasteurized milk products what is unpasteurized pasteurization we talked about pasteurization what is pasteurization Pasteurization is heating the milk at certain temperature for a certain time period. If the cattle was suffering from this pathology and you milked that cattle and you didn't pasteurize the milk, you didn't uh, heat the milk uh, so that this organism may die if it's in there, you didn't heat it, you just consumed it, it's going to get into your body and cause brucellosis. History of similar illness in the family. You have to ask about history of 
similar illness in the family that either if your father, mother, brother, sisters, cousins were living inside your home, have been affected because of it. Because then you'll know that there's a reason that this person is getting this disease. There must be a causative factor inside this family. It can be that sheep, it can be that cow, it can be anything. And this might be the pathological reason for getting this disease. And this person might have gotten this disease from the other person, right? It can also get through coitus. You know the meaning of coitus, right? So other uh, uh, factor with which it can get inside your body is coitus. So it can he can get it from her wife or her, the wife can get it from the husband. So this is also another factor to consider. And next on, you have accidental inoculation with veterinary brucella vaccines. If you accidentally inoculated yourself with brucella vaccines, you're going to get this disease. So what are the diagnostic clues? What are the points you go for the history? Uh, you, you go after in the history. Whenever you judge a patient, whenever you diagnose a patient, you always, always start from history, right? You go from your, what's your name? What's your father's name? What's your whole bio data? When were you born? To your presenting complaint. What's your presenting complaint? What have you presented with us? What have you presented to us with? That patient is going to tell you that I'm having these febrile illnesses. I'm having these uh, problems with uh, my body. I'm having these sweats. I'm having these tachycardias. I'm having these chills. I'm having these uh, uh, cardiac problems as well. You immediately think of, okay, I have like five to six different diseases that will help me get there. That will, uh, five to six different diseases that might be the reason for this person to suffer. And how do I confirm that which disease it might be? You go for the history. Then you ask different questions. And to get to Brucella, just like uh, to get to malaria, you asked whether have you slept outside, whether there are many mosquitoes in your areas, with, is there any pond in, with, uh, near to your home, that kind of questions. What will lead you to the diagnosis of Brucella? You'll ask for what? You'll ask for these six questions. Number one, was there any contact with any kind of animal which suffered from this disease? would suffer from recent abortion. Next, we'll ask if you have traveled into any endemic area, being a doctor or being a patient or being a friend, have you traveled to any endemic area? Number three, you're going to talk about, are you working in a microbiology lab where you uh, wash the samples all the time? Where you uh, have in, been in contact with some kind of blood or some kind of uh, uh, secretions of that person? Number four, we'll ask for the consumption of unpasteurized milk products. That have you ever been uh, taking that kind of milk which was unpasteurized and it was coming from that kettle which just ended up, had an abortion or even not you won't even know that know that cattle is having brucellosis if it's not pregnant how would you know so have you ever had uh, consumed this kind of unpasteurized milk in the last two months next we'll talk about a similar kind of history inside the family we talked about it can get through quite just the other way of getting inside your body is through coitus. And then the last but not the least, accidental inoculation of this veterinary brucella vaccine. Next on we have different laboratory tests. Now we have talked about all the history, right? Now what do we go for? We have uh, gotten like two to three differentials now, right? Maybe that person is also saying that yes, I slept outside. But yes, I'm having these problems too. So now you're confused between malaria, you're confused between malaria typhoid and brucella. Now, how do you confirm? For malaria, you will go for malaria parasite. You'll, for typh typhoid, you'll go for typhi dot. But what do you go for in the case of brucellosis? You'll definitely go for isolation of brucella. How will you isolate the brucella? You will go for uh, blood testing in which you'll isolate the brucella. And this is what it will look like and you'll know. You go for PCR, for uh, other diagnostic modalities, you'll go for PCR. PCR will confirm the presence of brucella. Then you'll go for serologies and serologies will also help you to understand or to confirm your diagnosis that it's brucella infection, it's brucellosis. Next on, you'll go for biochemical assays. And now biochemical assays will show what? 
Now, what I'm about to tell you are going to be in your mind for the rest of your life. These are pet, pet, pet clicks on your mind that if someone says to you, hepatic enzymes raised, it will be one click to you, right? I'm going to tell you different kind of serological results that Brucella will present to you with. First of all, hepatic enzymes will be raised. Next, bilirubin will be raised. Now, stop right there and tell me why hepatic enzymes and bilirubin are being raised. Because it was infecting your liver too. It was getting inside the liver too, right? It was causing the liver pathology too. So that's one way to look at things that, okay, the liver is being affected. Next on, you'll have decreased peripheral leukocyte counts. Why? It's an active infection. Leukocytes are going to be down. Why? It's, it should be up because they're being destroyed. They're not being produced in that much quantity. Lymphocytosis will be happening. Mild anemia will come in due to the destruction of all of these cells. Thrombocytopenia will come in. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is called DIC, basically is uh, the one coming into the plane here. Fibrinogen degradation products will be raised. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate will be raised. C-reactive protein levels will be raised. CSF lymphocytosis will be there. Decreased CSF glucose level will be there. And increased CSF adenosine deaminase will be there. Now, let's talk about all of them in a little bit of detail. Now, hepatic enzymes, bilirubin got raised because of the liver infection. Now, decreased peripheral leukocyte count happened because of this infection. Lymphocytosis happened because of this infection. And response of lymphocytes to this infection. Because they are going to be destroyed by lymphocytes. So, lymphocytosis will be there. Mild anemias and thrombocytopenias are a result of any infection which occurs in your body and lasts for long. They're going to affect your hemoglobin level. They're going to affect your platelets. What happens afterward? Disseminated intravascular coagulation will be coming in. DIC will come in, which is very dangerous in many cases, right? Next on, you will have erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Now, this is a test which comes into your, it comes into the play when you go for complete blood picture of uh, this person. ESR will be raised. What does ESR tell you? ESR tell you an active kind of inf infection is happening here. Then you go for C-reactive proteins. Yes, C-reactive proteins also tell you that active infection is going down. Next on, you will have CSF lymphocytosis. When you go for CSF examination, you will go for CSF examination and you will see the lymphocytes are being raised. Lymphocytes are much, much higher in concentration. CSF lymphocytosis will come in. Decreased CSF glucose level will come in because of this infection. We talked about in the first two, three slides, the glucose levels are going to go down. So in the CSF, you'll see decreased glucose levels and increased CSF adenosine deaminase will be there. And that's also because of this infection and the response of the body to it. Now let's talk about the serological examination and the which kind of antibodies will be found and how do we go for their confirmation, right? So first of all, you'll see IgA and IgG antibodies present, but they will be followed by what? IgM antibodies. What kind of serological testing you will go for? You go for the agglutination test. You will go for the complement fixation test. You'll go for the Coombs anti-globulin test. You'll go for the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And last but not the least, dipstick assay for the anti-Brucella IgM. Now, Keep it in mind that IgM is going to get into the play later on. Before that, in acute cases, in very acute uh, days, it's going to be IgG and IgA, but IgM will follow them. So it's not going to be positive in the very early days. It's going to be positive later on. So you cannot do them uh, early on and confirm your diagnosis. Now let's talk about what will you look for in the biopsy. You have talked about all of the clinical features. You have talked about all of the clinical uh, modalities that will come through. You have talked about what blood testing will look like. You have talked about what are uh, uh, the results of blood testing. Like it will be anemia, it will be thrombocytopenia, it will be uh, lymphocytosis, it will be all of those things. Plus, what will you look for in a bone marrow? For example, there were 40 patients and all of them were suffering from brucella. And you went for their bone marrow. What will you see? Now, in the 78% of patients, you will see hypercellularity. In 78% of the patients, you will see hypercellularity. Among them, after that, if you look for uh, 
what eosinophilia only 10 percent patients will have eosinophilia what what's the chances of granuloma there's 25 to 40 percent chances of granuloma findings in that biopsy you will see mega karyocytes in some cases like 30 to 40 percent you will see mega karyocytes so all of these findings are very mixed so what you find eventually in the bone marrow or sorry biopsy of this uh, Brucella infection, what you see is hypercellularity, megakaryocytes, next on eosinophilia, eosinophils present, and then granuloma formation. Next on, let's go for the radiological testing. When you'll go for the radiological testing, you'll know this is the affected area, this is being affected. Now, these are the consequences of it. Now, these are the affected areas, and that's how you diagnose it on radiological basis next on there's a very you know old kind of uh, rivalry going on between the diagnosis of tuberculosis and brucellosis because tuberculosis also does affect the spine it also affects the spine it also has these symptoms it also contains kind of the same symptoms but how we differentiate them first of all sight it's going to be lumbar and other regions tuberculosis it's going to be dorsal lumbar Next on, vertebra, which vertebra are going to be involved by brucellosis? It's going to be multiple or contiguous. On the other hand, it's going to be contiguous. It's not going to be multiple. So this is a point which can be same. It can be contiguous in brucellosis. It can be contiguous in tuberculosis. It can, uh, you know, be the same. This is not going to be the basic diagnostic point for you. But lumbar regions and dorsal lumbar regions are definitely the ones. Next on, what's discitis? It's going to be late in brucellosis, but it's going to be early in tuberculosis. Next on body, intact until late in brucellosis, but it's going to be uh, morphology lost in the very early stages of tuberculosis. Canal compression, it's going to be rare in brucellosis, it's going to be very common in tuberculosis. Epiphysitis, it's going to be anterior superior, it's going to be general, it's not going to be anterior superior, it's not going to be up and above, it's going to be general, it can happen anywhere. Osteophyte, it's going to be anterolateral, it's unusual in the cases of tuberculosis, it's unusual to find what osteophyte in the cases of tuberculosis. Next on deformity, wedging deformity is uncommon in the cases of brucellosis. On the other hand, in the tuberculosis, it's very common to have anterior wedges and gibbous and posterior wedges in some cases. Next on recovery chances, it's going to be sclerosed and it's going to affect the whole body. On the other hand, tuberculosis, it's very much variable. So these are the basic uh, kind of uh, differences between them. And the, on the end, we have to know that paravertebral abscesses are going to be small and localized in the cases of brucellosis and it's going to be common and discrete loss in the cases of tuberculosis. So that's how you differentiate between them on the basis of their radiological findings, on the basis of their uh, radiological modalities. You look for all of these things and you will know whether that patient is suffering from brucellosis or tuberculosis. At the other hand, we have saw abscesses. Saw abscesses are going to be rare in uh, brucellosis, but they are kind of a uh, hallmark for what? Tuberculosis. So our substances are found in tuberculosis, right? So that's how you differentiate them on the basis of their radiological findings and the basis of their clinical examination findings. So we have learned about all of it. You have learned about the causative organism. We have learned about their mode of transmissions. We have learned about their pathogenesis. We have learned about what clinical features it will present to with, uh, present to you with. What kind of uh, pathological manifestation does it cause? what kind of diagnostic modalities you'll go for, what kind of diagnostic modalities will tell you that yes, this is the confirmed diagnosis for brucellosis. Now, what's about the treatment? How do you treat this patient? You'll go for the antibiotics because a gram-negative bacterial cocci infection. So you'll go for all of those uh, antibiotics which kind of affect this uh, species, kind of affect this genre. So what are those? The doxycycline, streptomycin, rifampicin, gentamicin, uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and olfoxacin. Now, these are the antibiotics, chosen antibiotics, or you can say 
specific antibiotics which affect the gram negative cocci and that's why we start with these antibiotics and ciprofloxacin and kind of second degree if you don't get it treated by rifampicin and gentamicin you go for ciprofloxacin now these are the antibiotics chosen antibiotics or specific antibiotics you'll go for if a patient is suffering from brucellosis now treatment for adults and the gold standard is going to be I am streptomycin plus doxycycline or it's going to be in the tablet form it's going to be rifampicin plus doxycycline or in the high dose form of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole instead now these are three gold standard treatments in the in IV form it's going to be uh, or sorry it's in in the injectable form it's going to be intramuscular streptomycin plus doxycycline in the tablet form it can either be rifampicin plus doxycycline but if you are uh, kind of uh, uh, allergic to this these drugs or you have uh, uh, no specificity or no sensitivity to these drugs you go for high dose trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole instead what's going to be prophylaxis if you're going to be in contact with such organisms if you're working inside a kettle if you're working in the laboratory if you are a vet doctor what's going to be the prophylactic treatment for you that you don't get this disease by just before diagnosing the disease you go for rifamp rifampicin or rifampin plus doxycycline for three weeks after a low risk exposure before you get this disease before the incubation period comes in you go for rifampicin plus doxycycline for three weeks and for six weeks after a major exposure for example you drank that milk you took that milk you drank that milk and afterward that cow was diagnosed with brucella so it's a major kind of exposure it's a major exposure so you go for six weeks after this major exposure on the other hand if you have been in contact with blood and you had a break in your skin and you don't know whether it touched there or not you go for ifampicin for three weeks with a very low risk exposure so how we prevent this from happening how do we prevent brucellosis from happening first of all vaccine vaccines are available which will be live attenuated vaccines live attenuated strains your body will produce antibodies against them and you won't get this disease next one you'll have this testing and slaughter of infected herds and flocks you go on testing on regular basis of these flocks of animals and if someone got this disease you immediately go for the slaughter technique next on you have the control of animal movements next on you have active immunization of animals if these animals are suffering from it you can give active immunization and you can go for pasteurization of all milk products whether the patient whether the cattle is suffering or not you don't know it yet you have to go for pasteurization you have to heat it up to certain degrees for a certain time due to the uh, with the help of uh, pasteurization method you go through it and you won't get this disease now these are all the preventive methods that you have to look for that you have to follow through for not getting this disease now that's all for today regarding brucellosis thank you for watching skyler.com